Great. Super. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, supervisions basically are the backbone of how we teach theology, um, and philosophy of religion and religious studies at Cambridge. Um, so there are obviously lectures, there are classes, but actually the supervisions um, are really where a lot of the important stuff happens. Um, so what actually is a supervision? It, it's basically a one hour meeting between a, uh, a student, sometimes um, two students, um, with a member of the faculty who is teaching um, that particular paper um, to talk through um, an essay uh, or a piece of work about that paper which uh, the students have been doing. Um, so Hannah and I bought one of her papers last year on the conversion of the Roman Empire, uh, sorry last term. Uh, we met up five times over the course of the term. Um, each time Hannah had uh, gone away and spent most of her week uh, working through a reading list, uh, reading books, reading primary sources, and had then written me an essay, sent it to me, uh, we'd then met up for an hour uh, and we talked it through. We'd talked through uh, the issues, the, the concepts, we'd uh, clarified any misunderstandings, anything Hannah wasn't sure about. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, essay technique and how to improve. Um, and generally they're great fun because it's actually quite collaborative. Um, I'm, I'm still learning things um, as I supervise that I've never spotted before, um, that students help me see things uh, in a new light. Um, what Hannah and I are going to do for you is, is a kind of mock supervision. It's going to be a little bit different. So normally a supervision would be on the back of, let's say, a 2000 word essay. Um, some of the modules, as well as essays um, in the exams, also have what are called gobbits. Gobbits are kind of little, well, gobbits of text from primary sources. Um, that in the exam, Hannah will be required to write a sort of short analysis or commentary on. Um, so for Hannah's biblical paper, there'd be a few verses from, from say, a gospel or something to comment on. Um, for this paper, because it's a, it's a sort of history of Christianity paper, uh, they're primary sources um, from uh, the period. They are admittedly a little bit obscure, but Hannah is hopefully going to enlighten us. Um, Hannah's already sent me a bit of work, but I'm basically going to talk her through, well, she is going to talk me through um, these uh, gobbets now in front of you live um, and um, yeah we'll basically see how it goes. So Hannah let us start with gobbit number one which is uh, from the Theodosian Code and has these slightly strange people called Gratian and Valentinian and so forth. Um, what is this source? What kind of source is it? Um, so this is um, kind of like a legal document. It's a compilation of um, basically like all the laws um, in the Roman Empire. Um, it was it was compiled at, um, in the fifth century. So it contains laws from I think around 300 AD um, to then. Um, and this is from book 16, which is uh, all the laws concerning religious matters. Um, Great, so the um, book 16, because it's about Christianity, that's from sort of 300 onwards. Some of the other bits do go back earlier, say, to do with okay. murder, because there are much older Roman laws about murder. Um, why do you only get stuff about Christianity from 300, just to state the blinding uh, of it? Um, because that's when Constantine was emperor and uh, Christianity was legalised in the empire. So you're unlikely to get um, sort of pro-pagan laws under the Christian Empire. Um, so, so when is this compiled? I think you mentioned it already. Um, in the was it mid fifth century? Yeah, early to mid four twenties, I think. Um, but what about this particular law? Um, so this law is from three eight one. So, I guess how do we deal with that difference in time? Is that significant? Um, well, to some extent, but there's also, there's a lot of laws very similar to this from quite an extended period of time. Um, yep. So it's not like there's been a dramatic change in policy um, yes. after this law. Okay, let's dig into what the law actually says. So is this, you were sort of mentioned, is this a particularly distinctive law? Um, not particularly. I was just reading through it all again the other day and there are many, many laws saying um, don't sacrifice, 
uh, don't go into temples, um, don't do all these kind of pagan um, activities. Um, so a uh, couple of ways, things we can sort of pursue here. Um, what, uh, why do Christian emperors feel the need to legislate about what they're subject to doing in terms of sacrifices or religion? Hmm. Um, well, I guess uh, particularly regarding uh, pag pagan religion and kind of the, the old ways, um, it was believed by Christians um, to be demonic, like it, it wasn't just an, a neutral kind of activity, it was actively um, believed to be working ag against uh, Christians and um, yeah, there was a, a spiritual kind of evil nature to it. Um, yeah, so they're not just being interfering for the sake of being interfering, they, there's a sort mm -hmm. of moral problem here. Um, different angle what's you've already mentioned is what's the significance that there are so many laws that outlaw sacrifice you know why isn't one enough mm. um well it's quite interesting because there's i guess there's different aspects here so there's um the fact that the laws aren't necessarily um written to all peoples in all places um they were quite often written in response to um someone uh asking the emperors for their opinion on a certain matter and then they would respond with a law um but also these laws don't tell us how well they were enforced or um whether they were enforced and, and how it actually translated to um the activities of, of people in the empire um yeah so what um talk me through how precisely that's happening with this particular law code um so in this one, um, there's um, hmm. Hmm. so who, who do you think's asked for the law? Okay, um, so there's Florus, the Praetorian prefect. Um, it's so been what, written to him. What's a Praetorian prefect? Um, I was trying to find exactly what what it was. Uh, it's some kind of very high up. Uh, administrator person yeah in in the later Roman empire they they get very um fussy about titles and it gets all very intricate working out what the hierarchies mm. exactly are basically it's a kind of prime ministerial figure yeah. they would have had military responsibilities as well um but also legal ones so as you said clearly a legal problem has come onto Floris's desk and he's gone and asked the emperors and this is their official pronouncement. Um, but as you say, it's much more, re when we think law code, we think, you know, the prime minister trying to get an act through parliament and it's all very proactive, whereas this is much more reactive um, to a particular problem. Um, and Floris would only have been Praetorian prefect for a particular bit of the empire. Um, so as you say, this is applied to Flor Floris's jurisdiction, but isn't necessarily applied um, everywhere. So as you say, you go through book 16 of the Theodician Code and you get lots of edicts that look very similar, but actually you're replying to different bits of the empire. Mm. Um, how detailed or specific does this edict get? Um, not particularly. Um, so, um, like in, in terms of what they're outlawing, well, there's forbidden sacrifices, um, mm -hmm. which, I mean, sacrifices is quite clear, I would think, but it's not very specific. Um, so what, I mean, what could sacrifice refer to? Um, so it could be um, kind of blood sacrifice, so of, of animals, but then also it could be burning incense or, um, leaving things for statues of the gods um yeah. yeah exactly so there's quite a broad range of things what's you you pick this out in the answer you sent me what's the significance of calling it forbidden sacrifices um yeah it seems to be alluding to some of the earlier laws where it has already been outlawed so it's, it's like they're just reminding them that mm -hmm. yes this is already uh, forbidden yeah um as you say, it's a bit vague. It's a bit sort of rep repeating earlier stuff. Um, is there actually a punishment listed? 
Um, not really. Um, it's yeah, subject to proscription. Um, is it? Oh yeah, so it is. Uh, sorry, I missed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, um, prescription is when you have your property confiscated. Okay, uh, I thought it might be because that's what all the other laws say, but without saying prescription. Yeah. Yeah. Um, earlier in the Roman Empire, the, actually the timings of Julius Caesar and Co. sort of seizing power in the late Republic, um, prescription became quite a good way them, for them to raise cash quickly because <laughs> they could just seize the property of their political enemies. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you can annoy a lot of people very quickly. So, um, yes, I hadn't actually spotted that's interesting that's in there. Um, Given it's vague, it doesn't seem to be that clear exactly what the punishment might be. It seems to be very repetitive. Why, why do we think this edict is issued? Why do we think it's issued by these emperors at this point? Um, hmm. I mean, I would, I would guess that um, Florus probably has some issues with people who are sacrificing and uh, taking part in these kind of activities. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely one, one explanation it might have given them the occasion. Um, what's the significance of all three emperors being listed? Mm. Is that usual? Um, hmm. I think, um, I'm guessing no. <laughs> Yeah, so, it, well, there's, there's a famous one we looked at last term with Theodosius issuing a much longer and much more detailed thing, and he does that in his own name. Mm. So it's just the Emperor Theodosius. Um, I mean, we're backtracking a little bit. Why are there three emperors? Um, were they like emperors of slightly different parts of the empire? Yeah. Um, so, so I guess sort of um, yeah. if, if they're all saying it, then it's like the full force of the emperors? I don't know. Yes. yes. Um, so, yes. So, um, so this, we, it's not sort of, the, the empire is not permanently split into East and West mm. quite yet, but yes, basically the emperor, Roman Empire is too much for one person to rule at once. So it's become usual for co-emperors, well, to co-rule. Now, sometimes these co-emperors do not get on and fight wars against each other. In yeah. this case, they all, they do get on and I can't remember exactly how they're all related, but they are related and there's sort of marriage alliances and so forth going on. So again, given that Theodosius issues some edicts in his own name, what's the significance of issuing this together? Um, I guess maybe it's, it's Gratian and Valentinian saying, yes, we agree, like with what, Theodosius issued as well, or um, yes. What's the kind of political value of that? Um, hmm. Okay, modern example. What's the difference between um, Boris Johnson issuing a press statement and? Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and Jacob Rees-Mogg doing it together. I guess there's just more authority and kind of conviction behind it. I, yeah. Yes, it, it also shows they're working together. Mm. It shows it is sort of united fronts that you know. Uh, in this case, we are the emperors. We are we are in agreement. We are a harmonious collegiate group who have everything under control, um, mm. and are yeah and are doing this rather than one person kind of going lone wolf. Um, now, why do you think the date is significant, 381? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I haven't actually really considered the date much, to be honest. Um, I guess... Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Really. That's fine. Um, so Theodosius becomes emperor in the east in 379, so he's still quite new. Okay. And his position is quite vulnerable. Um, it's even though these three are working together, there are a lot of um, usurpers going on. There's a lot of political tensions going on. Um, similarly, I'm trying to remember the exact 
political shenanigans, but Gratian and Valentinian are also kind of uh, under threat. Everything is not well. So issuing this statement together is a kind of statement of, of, of power and, and unity at a time when potentially things are a little bit vulnerable um, and making it clear that we're working together. Um, now you, again, you brought this up in the answer you sent me. Why is, again, thinking of that kind of political dimension, the sort of risk of, you know, assassination or the army mutinying and that sort of thing. What's the significance of mentioning by day or by night and being a consulter of uncertain events? Um, also, um, being a consulter of uncertain events was when um, they tried to um, use sacrifice to see into the future and, and yeah. predict what was going to happen. So, um, I guess, uh, yeah, wasn't there some, I'm trying to remember, there was some example of someone predicting the emperor's death or something at some point, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's earlier in the century, but it, it gets them into a lot of trouble because, well, mm. why, why, why is that problematic? Because um, um, you're basically, like, inviting people to try and kill the emperor to some extent, I yeah. guess. Or, or at the very least, you're saying you don't really need to be loyal to the emperor because he's going to be dead in a few years anyway. Yeah. Um, it's even worse if, let's say, a soothsayer says, uh, not only is the emperor going to die soon, but the new emperor is going to be called X. That's, mm. you know, say you're trying to launch a coup. Um, yes, there are some obvious advantages of that. Um, what's the significance of night? Um, I guess was that when they would do these things? I don't know. <laughs> it, it's a, there's a long standing association in the Roman mind well back into the Republic and paganism, that nighttime is when you do sort of illicit religion. And mm. it's illicit, the religion is illicit precisely because it's got political implications, like predicting the fall, fall of an emperor or the fall of a consul. Um, at the same time, obviously gatherings, conspiracies gather at night. Yeah. So you're trying to discourage gatherings of politically motivated people with the added either excuse or kind of push um, of religion and soothsaying and divination and stuff um, going on. What's interesting is how almost conservative that prohibition actually is, as in mm -hmm. it's got a precedent that goes right the way back to the Republic, um, including the references to madmen and sacrilegious per persons. That's, yes, clearly as, as Christians, they are thinking about pagans, but mm -hmm. those are words that have a very long pedigree to mean people who do religion in a way that we do not like in the Roman mind. Now, the great irony was that much earlier Roman emperors had used that language to talk about Christians. Yeah. And the laws against Christians have a similar vibe. It's now been flipped, um, which is quite interesting when, you look, when you're thinking about the kind of conversion of the Roman state. Mm. Um, just, uh, I think, uh, before we're ready to move on to Augustine, but just as a quick rounding off, um, how much does this actually tell us about the Christianization or the conversion of the Roman Empire? Um, I mean, by itself, not a whole load. Um, I mean, when you, when you take it into um, kind of with all the other laws as well against paganism, you know that they were really pushing for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't tell us how it was enforced or yeah, the reality. Yeah. yeah it gives us more a sense of the aspirations of the emperor and those around them um, than yeah. actually how it's implemented. Although, as we discussed in supervisions last term, clearly most of the territory in the Roman Empire does become Christian. Yeah. You know, certainly mostly, most people in the Roman Empire are Christian within a, within a hundred or so years of this. So clearly something is going on. It's yeah. a case of how far the law codes are a good explanation of why that's the case. Good. Um, I think let us move on to Augustine, which hopefully people have in front of them. Uh, so quite a different source. Um, so yeah, tell kind of tell me about Augustine, Augustine's Confessions. What's the significance of this? Um, yep. So uh, this is an extract from Augustine's Confessions. He was um, a bishop um, in the Roman Empire, Bishop of Hippo. Um, and he wrote this during that time. Um, this was kind of 
it's an interesting work it's kind of like a bit of an autobiography um but then there's also some kind of theological statements that he's making with it um um yeah but it, it would have been written kind of for his friends I think is is quite so like it would have been circulated around his kind of social networks um yeah. for them to read um, um so yeah friends and students yeah. things like that uh where does this passage come from in the the bit in the narrative um so this is kind of right kind of at the climax of um, the story of his conversion to Christianity. Um, so, he, yeah, um, it's book eight, I think. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting, there's 12 books to the confessions and the kind of conversion happens actually shortly after the halfway mark. And in that sense, it's not a conventional spiritual autobiography. That there is no such thing as a conventional spiritual at this point. Um, mm. The last, uh, at least the last two books, maybe more, um, go on to, there's this massive discourse on the theology of time. It has nothing to do with Augustine's life at all. Um, and in that sense, as you say, it's not quite a autobiography. Mm. Um, but yeah, book eight is kind of, it builds up towards this sort of great emotional climax when he finally takes the step to become uh, a Christian, which happens pretty much in the following paragraph yeah. uh, the Lord I gave you. So given the conversions still to come, what, what's interesting about this particular paragraph? Um, so it's quite interesting because it's, it kind of describes um, the moment just before where um, kind of, what eventually pushes him over the edge when he does pick up a book and read it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's kind of the divine intervention almost in his conversion, um, like this, this moment where he hears this voice. Um, so trick question for you, <laughs> is this a miracle? Yes. Um, okay, well, obviously I'm gonna ask you why, <laughs> in what way. Um, well, I guess in, in how Augustine is describing it, it mm -hmm. he, he's definitely Im implying that it is um, this voice has kind of uh, broken into his like emotional turmoil that's going on that's just been described in the previous kind of passage. Um, and he's, yeah, he's saying, I don't know where it came from. Um, and immediately he's like, transformed just from hearing voice um yeah okay there's a, there's a few things to unpack here so does he think that it's god himself talking to him um he doesn't he doesn't seem to suggest that exactly so i don't i don't know whether he's quite implying that it was a child that he heard that it kind of it was uh god like directing um mm -hmm. or whether this voice of a child he heard was just kind of like in his mind um from yeah I think, I think reading it i'd probably err on the side that it is actually just a boy or a girl playing next door whose voice he hears and yeah. in that yeah. sense it's um it's fairly mundane mm. um so it's worth thinking like what what's special about this almost how is god involved so why what how does how does augustine signal to us that this is this is in some way unusual um well i get because he he kind of questions that himself doesn't he i started to ask myself mm -hmm. um whether it was common for children to say this specifically yes. whether they're going around singing pick it up and read it um, exactly um so even if it is a child playing next door it seems pretty odd and unusual so there's something a bit bit odd going on um in what other way might we want to sort of say that there's something miraculous or god godly about this um, As you've mentioned, sorry you've already mentioned there's the kind of immediate effect on his expression which we'll come back to um yeah um he says i've never heard anything quite like it um, um so and basically this, this partly comes down to what is a miracle 
um, or rather what does Augustine think a miracle is? Um, I mean, how, how would you define a miracle? I guess something that uh, like is outside of how things usually work, like outside the, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> we just mean, so so and this, this this is precisely the point is this is unusual you know children don't normally shout this sort of thing when they're playing games but it's hardly impossible yeah um so there's a difference between perhaps saying something that's unusual but it still has i don't know let's call it a natural explanation mm. and something that is impossible according to the laws of nature and yet which still happens like i don't know let's take a random example someone rising from the dead yeah um, that is clearly a, a sense in which God has suspended natural law um, to do something. Whereas, I don't know, how would we describe this case mm. in terms of God's actions? Yeah, may maybe miracle isn't quite the right word, but um, there's some sense of, of God being involved in doing something. Yes. Um, um, and this is, th this is the subtlety. So, uh, sorry, this is the slightly tricky, tricky part of the question. Most of what we think of as miracles in terms of a, that kind of idea of the suspension of natural law mm. is a much later definition. So it develops in right. the substantial Middle Ages, people like Aquinas, who are trying to work out uh, how the natural and the supernatural worlds fit together, and they develop a much more sort of logical sort of way of thinking about it. Augustine is much less concerned with exactly how these events happen Mm. He's perfectly aware that some things have natural explanations and some things don't, but he just doesn't think that's that's not what's important here. What's important is that this is God trying to do, or trying and succeeding to do mm. something. So Augustine's much more concerned with the purpose of what we might call divine agency, you know, God acting. So for Augustine, obviously, God causes everything. You know, God causes, you know, rain, sun, mm. you know, uh, the fact that he's sitting in a nice garden and so forth um and yet within all of that divine activity there's a specific event that happens which has the specific effect of augustine's expression changing and him being going and reading this bit of uh it's one corinthians i think it's that he reads isn't it um so that that's why asking you whether it's a miracle is a slightly slippery mm. question clearly i mean part of the issue is that god doesn't necessarily intervene because god is causing everything anyway it's right. simply that mm. Augustine can discern particular ends in this case. And he explicitly says, doesn't he? I understood it as nothing short of divine providence. Yeah. It's being a sort of God, you know, everything is ruled by divine providence for Augustine. It's just that in this case, he can actually see it and see perhaps why it is happening. Um, although, is this something he sees at the time or when he's writing? Mm, well, that's the really interesting thing thinking about with with this um, source I found, because, yeah, he's describing events that happened 14 years earlier. So I, I think there definitely is um, some aspect of of him. Yeah, like retrospectively looking back from where he is now. Um, I don't yeah, I don't know if in the moment he were he saw it as such um but then he does say i, I don't know yeah no, no go on, go I, on. he said he seems to say that he did notice it at the time i understood it um yes but, and i think something clearly makes him open the book yeah um now it's a case of whether he didn't quite understand or he didn't have the christian understanding of what was going on at the time, well, obviously he wasn't a Christian at that point, mm -hmm. um, but retrospectively he can see what was going on, that clearly something was going on that made him want to um, to pick up the book. And this is the whole tricky, this is the thing at the heart of this paper is how do you study conversion? Because people don't know they're converting until they've converted. It's very mm -hmm. hard to, you don't realize what's happening until it's actually happened. And this is a sort of classic case of, in a sense, Augustine probably couldn't have written anything at the time because he wouldn't have realized the significance and yet clearly you have to account for the fact that Augustine is a Christian when he writes this and wasn't 15 years previously yeah um something else that just occurred to me just looking at this um 
providence is not just a Christian doctrine. So in a sense, there, there's plenty in pagan philosophy or some pagan philosophies that does have an understanding of providence. Um, so Seneca actually um, yeah. uh, has a lot to say about providence um, and Christian theologians make quite good use of him. So it's entirely possible that in his pre-Christian worldview, if you like, yeah. there's something significant going on. So there's all sorts of things we can we can we can unpack just from from that bit. Um, what's the what's the significance actually of what the child says? Why why is reading significant here? Um, well, I think in some ways it's kind of a bit like self-referential <laughs> because this is this is in a book that um, mm -hmm. that he's inviting other people to read um, that has like well that one of its purposes probably is to uh convert others or or make them question what they believe so um that is a very very good point um and what's significant in the paragraph that kind of makes that even more complex and interesting because mm, then he also um references the story of anthony um mm -hmm. who was um and um, um a man earlier who had and his story had been told earlier in in confessions about how he was converted um from hearing um a line from scripture when he was in church and and this was being told by an, another man who had been converted while reading the story of this man of Anthony um mm. so there's a lot of stories of conversion yeah. that are impacting other people um, in their conversion um, and reading and stories is a big part of that. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating that Augustine decides at this climactic moment of the narrative and you're like, no, 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 tell me what you read, tell me how you, <laughs> no, no, I just want to remind you about Anthony. It's like, I don't care about yeah. Anthony, I want to know about the conversion. Um, really significant that he mentions Anthony at precisely this point. And as you say, it's because he probably envisages the confessions having a similar function to how the life of Anthony which again recounts a conversion and was circulating um, among Augustine's circle. I guess what's the, well, you, you have people who read Antony's story and convert, that's happened earlier in Confessions. Augustine may have intended the Confessions to convert people. How is that different from Augustine and Antony's conversions themselves? Um, as what they're reading is yeah. scripture, it's yeah. the Bible. Um, and um, why do you think it's significant that it's scripture that converts them? Um, I guess it kind of feeds in a bit to almost like the theology of, of scripture at the time of like the role of scripture in the church, in Christianity. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, if you think, you know, Augustine probably has quite a high opinion of his writing abilities, but he knows he's not writing scripture because mm -hmm. scripture is written by God. Um, and there is a sense in terms of what they think conversion is, or Augustine thinks conversion is, if conversion is God himself calling you to himself, then you necessarily need God's words to affect that. Um, I mean, one could also one could imagine perhaps that being converted through the life of Anthony was almost a sort of second grade conversion because you weren't converted <laughs> directly through the words of God. Or, or instead you were converted by the words of God that happened to be in the life of Anthony rather than the life mm. of Anthony itself. Um, so there's lots of really, really interesting layering going on here. Um, you've got to watch Augustine like a hawk when you're reading him because there's so much going on. Um, of course, what does this, all this emphasis on reading, what does this presume about the kinds of people that Augustine and Anthony were and the kind of people they were trying to reach? Yeah, well, it's the people who can read, which is yeah. generally the elite, so um, and yeah. wealthy, or, wealthier yeah. people. Or at the very least, the, well, More. literacy in the Roman Empire is hotly debated. I think it's mm. safe to say it's people who had books or scrolls yeah. and could pick up and, and read. Um, literacy was probably a little bit more widespread, particularly in the cities, but that's quite different from owning. I mean, Augustine here seemed seems to have his own, either his own Bible or his own copy of the Pauline epistles, which in itself is, mm -hmm. um, uh, is quite significant. Interestingly, it's a 
book, not a scroll, um, which is an interesting point. Christ the book wasn't invented by Christians, but Christians used tended to use books rather than scrolls um, for, for collecting the Bible. So that's just an interesting thing that he has a, a very sort of Christian mode of text um, accessible mm -hmm. already. I mean, the very fact that he's sitting there with a bit of the Bible anyway also says something interesting about his conversion process. Mm -hmm. um, great, uh, well done. Um, I think, yeah, if you were able to cover even two thirds of that in, in the time in the exam, um, you'd be doing very well. Um, yeah, I think, I think make sure, certainly when you're answering, try and, try and really push into the complexity of the layering. Because if you can bring that out, you're, you're showing the exam that you really, you really have understood um, mm. Augustine. So don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to push things that maybe seem a little bit far-fetched because actually, certainly in Augustine's case, it probably isn't far-fetched. <laughs> Um, just thinking about the answer on the Theodosian Code, um, yeah, try and think of the various motivations. There's always, there's usually at least two or three possible explanations that are worth trying to cover. So I think just trying to push the political motivation as well as just the religious motivation um, would be helpful. And again, just, you know, keep an eye on the date of, yeah. of when because often, particularly with Book 16 of the Theodosian Code, it will often be at political crisis points, they tend to legislate more um, to sort of shore up their own position. Uh, but well done. Um, great. I think that uh, that's probably enough on Theodosius and Augustine. Um,